once you understand this, then we can start talking clinical application. Edema. Okay. All right. So, but does this make sense to all of you guys? Right? Okay. So now if you understand that, then you could actually understand what edema is. Now, um, just for people who don't know what edema is, that's basically fluid in your interstitial area. For some reason, there's a buildup of fluid here. You know, like I said, there's three liters and your lymphatics take it. But what if your lymphatics don't take it? Or let's say there's 30 liters that goes up here, but only uh, 25 come back. The lymphatics will take three, but that leaves another two left up here. Or let's say you have, let's say, um, 50 liters going up there, but only 27 come back, and the lymphatics take only three. Then you're going to have a massive amount of fluid over here. That's edema. Okay? And that's what we got to explain um, what, where this all comes from. All right, so we have an excess amount of fluid in the interstitial area. And we have different reasons why we get this. And this is what's important for you to deal with pathophysiology. Okay? First off, you can increase the capillary pressure. What if your hydrostatic pressure is so great, it's going to push more fluid out there? I.e., you have high blood pressure. If you've got high blood pressure, it's going to push more fluid out there. And only 27 can come back. And only lymphatics can only take the 3 liters. So there's going to be extra amount up there. Get a demo. This edema building. Does that make sense? Right? What about if you decrease these albumins? Well, we got to go back to A and P. Where is albumin made? What organ makes the proteins in your blood? Which organ makes the fibrinogen? Which organ makes the clotting factors? Which organ makes all these proteins, in al including albumin? Which organ? Starts with an L, ends with liver. Liver, there you go, okay? So liver does all this. So liver is going to make albumin. But if you have cirrhosis of the liver, which is a scarred liver, you have hepatitis, you've got some kind of liver cancer, if there's some kind of liver failure, you're not going to make albumin. Now that's going to make a difference. Look. If normally, I'm just going to give you numbers here. If normally you have albumins over here, and let's draw 10 albumins. Okay? And we do the normal thing going up and down, right, the, the oncotic pressure. But now, your liver is not working properly, and that liver only makes three albumins. So we are making this more dilute. You still have the same number of proteins over here. We didn't change those. The liver doesn't do those. They only do the proteins in the bloodstream. So look what's going to happen here. We still have, well, this is more dilute than what's over here. So we're going to get more fluid going up there because that's more, much more concentrated than what this is. So you're going to get more fluid going up there and less fluid coming back. Does that make sense? Because we are making this less concentrated. So if you have liver disease, it would make sense that you also have edema because you can't make those albumin. If you use it as nurses, can actually give albumin through a bag and infuse it into the person's blood. That's why you give albumin. If more fluid is going to go into here, that means what happens to your blood pressure? If fluid is going to leave your capillaries and go into the interstitial area and swell you up, what happens to the blood volume? during that time? Increase or decrease? Decrease. If you decrease the blood volume, what happens to your blood pressure? 
drugs. Not good. So, as a nurse, the doctor orders it. Now, there's a lot of other things that can happen that won't give it because there's other diseases that you may have. But if you put more albumin into the person's blood, can you, um, can you understand that the fluid from here is now going to be drawn into the bloodstream? And then what happens to your blood volume? Increases. What happens to blood pressure? Yeah. So albumin will increase your blood pressure. Okay? These are the things you're going to need to know with pharmacology and all. Don't forget this stuff. Now, we have problems, we could have problems making the, the albumin, but we could have problems losing albumin. Your kidneys are not supposed to allow proteins to escape and go into your urine. You should not have proteins in your urine. Your kidney is a big strainer that has holes in it, but only to allow water to go through, not meatballs. Proteins are much bigger. But if, those, if you have some kind of kidney disease and those holes get big and allow the proteins to go through, now you have protein in your urine. Uh, in your urine. We call that protein urea. Again, if someone has protein urea, they're losing these. Does that mean they get edema? Yes. For a different reason. You either can't make the proteins, or you're losing proteins. Pathophysiology. Okay? Make sense? Okay. What about if you increase the capillary permeability? A pretty easy one to understand. These are all simple squamous epithelial cells, which I can kind of draw for you. All right. Well, what happens if we make the spaces in between here much bigger? The fluid is going to be able to go out there much more readily, right? And it's hard to go back with all the pressure there. So if you have certain toxin, toxins will do that, exotoxins, endotoxins doing that, certain infections will do toxins, even burns. If you've seen someone really burned bad, I mean in the hospital and stuff, you'll see them very swelled up because all the fluid goes out there. Make sense? And what if you have some kind of lymphatic blockage? Say you have lymphoma. You have a lymph node that is filled with cancer cells. Now that three liters that's supposed to go back through the lymphatics is going to see a motor vehicle accident, a blockade there. So the fluid can't get through there, so the fluid is going to stay here. And that too is going to cause edema. Does that make sense? You see how you, you have to put this all together. Pathophysiology. A lot of passion in this stuff because it makes sense. But you've got to build from what you already have been taught. All right? So, circulatory shock um, is any condition in which blood vessels are inadequately filled and blood cannot circulate normally. It can be a hypovolemic shock, results from a large scale. You cut off your arm, blood just comes out. Well, now you have your blood pressure goes drops all the way down. You don't have enough blood to get throughout your whole body. So we call that hypovolemic, right? Low volume. That's what that stands for. Because you just lost a massive amount of blood. Okay? You get a shock, so to say. Certain things will do this. Anaphylactic shock, so to say. That's going to make your blood vessels dilate. You've got the same amount of blood volume in there, but now you have a bigger space. So your blood pressure goes down. Or you could have cardiogenic shock, just that the heart can't pump blood because it doesn't work as good as it used to. 
So you're going to lose blood pressure that way. And you're going to go into shock that way. Does that make sense? Right? Okay. So this, again, step by step, just follow it. The same pictures I give for my AMP, just reiteration. Okay? Go step by step. They're important things. Just take like 15 minutes. Just make sure you understand. If this happens, then what's the next step? What's the next step? Don't memorize. It should just make sense to you about what's going on here. Okay? All right. So let's talk a little bit about congestive heart failure. Okay? Congestive heart failure is that the heart, for some reason, is not pumping blood effectively to parts of the body. Okay? And it gets congested. Now, there could be a lot of reasons what causes this, all right? Um, coronary artery atherosclerosis, where the uh, blood vessels uh, of the coronary arteries actually get blocked, and they don't give enough uh, efficient um, nutrients to the heart muscle, so the heart muscle is not going to be able to contract properly. Um, you got persistent high blood pressure that can cause this. There could be uh, multiple heart attacks that can cause this, just dead tissue, and it's not squeezing properly. Or there could be congenital um, heart defects in there, some dilated uh, cardiomyopathy. So we'll go into all of those when we get into the heart. But I want to show you how you can actually apply this stuff to the heart. And we we'll talk about two different heart failures. There's one that's called left heart failure, and there's one that's right heart failure. Okay? So you can put your pencils down. Everything will be recorded. I just want you to, to I just want to go step by step from what you already learned from A and P and, ap and apply it to what we're dealing with over here. Okay? So we have left heart failure, right heart failure. So left heart pumps blood to where? The whole body, right? The right heart pumps blood to the lungs. Okay? So already, if you've got right heart failure, you have an idea where the blood's not going. If you have left heart failure, you have an idea where the blood's not going. Does that make sense? Well, that's what I'm saying. You're building from what you already know. So let's just put your pencils down on this. Let's just go step by step and see if you can handle this. It's not hard to do. So we have this as left heart failure. Okay? Now... For some reason, that left heart is not pumping blood forward. It's just not working. Multiple heart attacks, um, atherosclerosis, whichever. So look what's going to happen. If your heart is not pumping properly, your left heart, then what's that going to do to your cardiac output? Does your cardiac output go less? The amount of blood leaving your heart is going to be less or is it going to be more? Less. Okay? That means what happens to your blood pressure? it drops. Okay? Now, that'll eventually, 20% of that blood that leaves the left heart is going to go to the kidney. As I told you before, the kidney will sense this low blood pressure, and it's going to release what in response to the low blood pressure? Renin. Renin. Okay? Now, this is what's going to happen. Renin gets released, the blood pressure goes back up. But as soon as it does that, it stops making the renin, and the blood pressure goes right back down because the cardiac, because the left heart doesn't stop. It keeps. It's not. It's still bad. We didn't fix it. So what's happening is that we have a continuation of low blood pressure all the time in this. But the kidney, through negative feedback, says we can't have that. We got to get the blood pressure back to normal. So it releases more renin, but the blood pressure goes back down. So the kidney gets smart after, after a while and says, look, I'm done with this. We're just going to send a lot more renin out because it's always going down. So it sends, it overshoots and sends too much renin so that if you have too much renin, what happens to your blood pressure? Okay. It goes up. So when people with left heart failure, you don't ever see the low blood pressure. You will always see the high blood pressure because the kidney's response to it. Does that make sense? Okay. You always, so people with left heart failure will have high blood pressure. Now, 
Let's go back to the left heart. It's congested. The blood, for some reason, in the left heart can't be squeezed. It's weak. Too many heart attacks. Whatever reason. So it can't squeeze the blood forward. So therefore, the blood in the left ventricle, if it's supposed to squeeze, let's say, 75% of its blood out there, now it's only putting out 40%. So then the left ventricle is going to have a lot of residual blood in it. Does that make sense? So that's where we get the word congested. It gets congested with blood. So now there's more blood in the left ventricle, so the left atrium is going to have problems squeezing blood in the left ventricle because there's an extra amount there. So there's a backup of blood in the left atrium now. If there's a backup of blood in the left atrium, then what organ is going to have a backup of blood also? The lungs. And the, now you're going to have pulmonary congestion. What happens with these patients is that they can't breathe. They're short of breath because it's congested their lungs. And the blood sits in there, and it's not unlikely, be pretty common, for them to have hemoptysis. They cough up blood because there's so much blood in their lungs because of the backup. Does this make sense? All right, you can see, you can easily memorize all the side effects or all the manifestations of left heart failure. Don't. Understand why you get all those. If you understand the pathophysiology, you'll understand what happens here. Okay? So, that's left heart failure. Let's look at right heart failure and see what the manifestations, why are they, are they different, are they the same? Let's look at that. So now you have the right heart. The right heart normally pumps blood to where? The lungs, okay? But for some reason, the right heart is just not efficient enough to push blood forward multiple heart attacks, atherosclerosis, it could be multiple different things, but you can't push it there. So instead of pushing, like I said, with the left heart, you can't push 75%, now it can only push maybe 40%. So now the blood is going to sit there, all right, residual blood. So you're going to have less blood going into your lungs. Does that make sense? Is there going to be more or less blood going into the left atrium? Less. What about the left ventricle? What about the cardiac output? What happens to blood pressure? What happens to what? What does the what does the kidney want to release because of that? Renin. What happens to blood pressure? Goes up. So what I'm saying here is that in right heart failure and left heart failure, you have high blood pressure. See it? Same mechanism. Okay. Will they be short of breath? Will they their lungs fill? Will they have hemoptysis? No. Do you see why? Don't memorize. Understand. But you need to understand the blood flow to the heart. If you don't know the blood flow to the heart, this won't make any sense to you guys. See? Got to know that stuff. Now, let's go back to the right heart. Since there's residual blood in the right ventricle, the right atrium is going to have problems squeezing that blood forward, is it not? So the left atrium is going to fill up with blood or no? It's, filled, it's, it's congested. Now, what happens to, is there going to be a, uh, a back of a blood in the inferior and superior vena cava? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, because of gravity, the inferior vena cava is going to be affected first. There's going to be a back of a blood in the inferior vena cava, and because of gravity, the feet get hit first. And because there is an increase of pressure that's happening in the feet, fluid is going to leave the blood in the feet, in the blood vessels, and go into interstitial area. The feet are going to swell up. They're going to get edematous. Edema is going to ensue down there. 
depending on how severe it is, the edema will start at the feet, go to the ankles, the shins, the knees, they can go all the way up to the thighs. And you'll be assessing that as a nurse to see where that is. And we actually use words like, you know, pedal edema, pedal meaning feet, pedal edema plus one, plus two, goes all the way to plus four. Plus four is in the five, just to give you an idea with that. Yesterday it was a plus one, today it's a plus two. It's getting worse. You see? Eventually, if it keeps on going, it'll go into your abdomen. And you'll start getting fluid in the abdomen, something called ascites. Once that all gets filled up over there, now it's going to revert to the superior vena cava. Now this is over months. But it goes to the superior vena cava. And what you're going to see is that veins that go into the superior vena cava are your jugular veins. Those you can see in your neck. And when a person's lying down at 45 degrees, you will see the jugular veins over here distended, filled with blood. As the heart pumps, because sh there shouldn't be a pulse there, right? You shouldn't see. But you'll see it throbbing. Why? Because every time that right heart contracts, the blood goes whatever it can forward, but some of it goes backwards, so some of it will fill the jugular veins, and that's when you see it fill it up. There's a back of the blood. If that gets all filled up, what's the next organ that's going to get affected? The brain. And that's where they get comatose. When you start getting cerebral edema, edema of the brain, there's so much fluid in there, it's pressing on the brain, they get comatose. Can you get rid of some of this? Yeah, again, I'm not trying to make doctors out of you, but yes, you could get diuretics. But there's problems with diuretics, especially, it depends on if they're 80 years old with congestive heart failure, um, if they have kidney failure, because if they have kidney failure, you can't give them diuretics. Because you're overworking the kidneys that are not working so well. So there's a lot of facets to do that. And you'll get to learn a lot about this stuff if you work in the cardiac unit or intensive care unit. And you could concentrate on it because it's usually one nurse to one or two patients, as opposed to a med surge floor. It's what, 16 patients to a nurse, something like that, right? So does this make all sense to you, right? It's step by step. You want to memorize it and make your life harder, you'll probably do okay with the tests that I have because you'll have that memorized and you'll probably get those. But... You'll have to re, re you have to recall and probably reteach yourself all this when you get into you know when you study for your NCLEX or pharmacology. But if you understand why you had get all these signs and symptoms, then that's something you could bring forward when you get into pharmacology and NCLEX. It'll make more sense to you. It'll stay with you longer. Okay, is that clear? All right. So this is what pitting edema looks like. You haven't seen it. Where you actually press that on the feet over here, when you let go, your fingerprints are still there because there's so much fluid there. I kind of I think of this as like your, uh, if you're in high school, they have those wrestling mats. You press down and let go, your fingerprints are there until they fill right back up. Right? I've seen pitting edema so bad that yellow fluid is coming out of it. We call that weeping edema. So it depends on how bad. Okay? But you'll need to assess that as a nurse to see how bad this is. Okay?